cast, cast the devil out of the sound system. Amen. I think sometimes the devil does get involved in things he has no business being involved in, don't you? Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. Especially this year, it seems like uh, first part of the meeting it worked fine, then all of a sudden it's uh, static, static, static. So I don't know what's changed, do you? Cables are still in the same place, plugged in the same port, I don't understand it. But anyway, we're hoping that, uh, you know, we will, we will try to find the problem before next year. Come back. We got a whole year to work on it. And my resident genius, I call Brother Paul Duncan my resident genius. If I have a problem, he can figure it out. So, uh, Paul, we got a problem. So handle it. Handle it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I've enjoyed being here. And now I'm getting my voice back and the meeting's about over. <clears throat> but thanks to everyone that gave me cough drops. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord tonight. Praise God. Wow. Well, I feel like the Lord clearly directed me today. You just pray that I'll be able to preach it the way He gave it to me. I want to mind Him. But I realize tonight I'm preaching to the choir. And uh, that's all right. I don't mind preaching to the choir. But you know, those of us who are in the choir, in other words, we've been around here a long time, and we ought to have some things settled, right? We ought to have some things settled. But even if we have it settled and there's no spiritual need in our heart at the very moment, there's still truth to be learned so that we can convey that to someone else. The church really needs to come back to studying the scriptures, learning the doctrine so that they can teach others also. So that you can give an answer to any man that asketh you a reason of the hope that lieth within you in meekness and in fear. You know, the preacher, well, ask him, he knows. <laughs> he went to Bible school, he, he has the answers. Ask my preacher, he knows. Well, I tell you, you ought to know by now most everything I know. Some of you have been in this school longer than I have. You don't want to admit it, but some of you have. Tonight I'd like to share with you a message. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Stick another one of your fingers in Ephesians chapter 2. I'd like to talk to you tonight about a question. What is the goal that Christ really wants us to be striving for? And that goal could be different depending on what state of grace we're in tonight, okay? That goal could be different for a sinner than it is a believer, could be different from a believer than it is someone that's sanctified. But what is the end game? What does really Christ want our life to do in this life? What is the end result that he wants to produce in us, in other words? You find the three states of men in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. You're going to find, I'm going to read three or four verses, and you're going to see the three classes of men spiritually. But the natural man, verse 14... That's the unsaved man or woman. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And he, as I'll show you in Ephesians, is spiritually dead. You can't discern much when you're dead, can you? There ain't much discernment in a dead man. So the natural man or the natural woman that is unsaved is dead spiritually. Not, not physically, but spiritually. And then it talks about, verse 15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. This is the sanctified man, the spiritual man or woman. Chapter 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, 
even as unto babes in Christ. There you have it. You have the natural man, the, uh, the, the unregenerate. You have the carnal person who is a babe in Christ. And carnality is, is a prolonged infancy. It's really what it amounts to. You're, you're still a babe in Christ. You're still drinking milk and you're still wanting to have those baby privileges even though you have a full-grown beard. You know, that's, uh, you know, there's a time to grow up spiritually. There's a time to move on and to advance spiritually. So the carnal person, I've told my church over and over, I'd like to have 20 carnal people right now by the biblical definition of carnal. Babes in Christ. Because then you can feed a baby, and if you feed it good, keep it warm and dry, it'll grow. Amen. And it'll begin to learn. And so the babes in Christ need to learn. But there's your three states. And every one of us tonight, if we be honest with ourselves and honest with God, we will, we will put ourselves in one of those three categories. Unsaved, saved but not sanctified, or sanctified tonight. Now let's turn to Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses in sin and sin. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the word of God. We thank you for divine truth tonight. Help us to divide it. Help us to proclaim it. Help us, Father, to explain it. And to try to make it so that every one of us here can see the very realities of some of the truth you have laid upon my heart tonight. Father, we want to know what you want from us, where you want us to get to, how you want to take us there. And Lord, we need to have the plan of salvation understood in our ranks so that we can go out here and tell a lost and dying world, this is what salvation is all about. Father, help us tonight as we endeavor to speak. Help your people. Give them ears to hear. Give them a mind and a heart to understand and receive. And give us a will to obey. For, Father, we must come to the light and then we must walk in the light. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The first phase of salvation is, of course, regeneration. And I would stop and ask the question, is that the final goal? that God has for His church? Brother Manley shook his head this way. You need to shake your head this way. As glorious and wonderful as coming from spiritual death to spiritual life is, as radical as that is, as phenomenal as that is, as glorious as that is, it's not the end. It's the beginning. It's the very beginning. Adam and Eve died spiritually the moment they disobeyed God. Do you believe that? How many believes that? It was hundreds of years later that they died physically, but they died spiritually the very moment they sinned, and sin immediately brought a break in the communion with God, did it not? God no longer walked in the garden with them in the evening. God, in fact, had to bring them and remove them from the paradise garden because they were no longer worthy to be in there with the tree of life. Sin separates. Sin kills. And so because Adam and Eve died spiritually, so every one of Adam's race is born spiritually dead. But thanks be unto God, God knew that from the beginning, and He planned redemption with such a way that he can bring us back to life. Aren't you glad? Let me ask you something tonight. What do you think if I had a corpse up here, and I don't, but if I had a beautiful casket and a beautiful corpse and Bibles and things, and to educate him, would it help that dead man any if I could educate him a little? Can't educate a dead man. I know we'll get the greatest physician, Dr. Wilson. Good to have his family, him, we're... We could get the greatest physician in America and get him to bring the greatest pill bottle he has. Or maybe those old needles. You know, when we were kids, they didn't give pills. 
They bent you over and gave you a penicillin shot. <laughs> Every time we went to the doctor, I dreaded going to the doctor. There were two things. He had a wooden stick in a jar, and he was going to gag me half to death before I could get out of there. I hated that. I have, a, I have a huge gag reflex to this day, and I blame it on the doctor back there in West Virginia that gagged me. Every time my parents took me to the doctor, he gagged me. But when he was through gagging me and looked at me, and he finally said, well, we've got a shot, bend over. They didn't put it in the arm, I don't think. It seemed to always put it in an embarrassing place. But if we could get the greatest doctor in America, the greatest physician that America has produced, with the greatest medicine that America has produced, or China, and get him here and get him in front of this dead man, would we help him any? Friend, the only thing tonight that can help a dead man or a dead woman is resurrection power. The only one who has resurrection power is Jesus Christ. The only one that can bring the dead back to life is God himself. And so God has put in his plan. When we find the, the plan of God here, and regeneration is such a wonderful work of grace. I have more messages on the new birth. Well, I have a lot of messages on sanctification too, so it might be close. But I love to preach on the new birth. I love to preach what John said. We have now passed from death unto life, and we know we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. John believed in a resurrected experience of the new birth. You come alive. Paul said it's quickening. It's something that sensitizes us and gives us new life again spiritually. We can sense God and we can talk to God and we can hear from God again. Our spirit's now made alive unto God. What a privilege. What a work of grace. Hallelujah. Everybody ought to want to be saved so they could come alive. And I haven't even touched on pardon, adoption, justification oh friend regeneration there are so many facets to it it's like a multifaceted diamond every way you look at it the light shines through it and the glitter and the radiancy of this gem that God has provided for us this great salvation think about the blood of Jesus and what procured this great salvation friend this is a multifaceted diamond but as great as it is it is not the pinnacle of redemption let's move on shall we sanctification how we enjoy that theme don't we we've heard a lot about it this week and I think we should make much of it don't you I believe that salvation will never be complete until all sin is dealt with not just yours your transgressions are dealt with in regeneration. Your sins are blotted out when you confess and forsake them. But friend, there's a sin that you were born with. This alienation, this depravity, this pollution that is in your spirit, God must take it out and cleanse it. What a glorious God that has provided an uttermost salvation from sin. An uttermost salvation. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Excuse me. 8 times. In the Bible it says, be ye holy, eight times. There are so many other commands and exhortations and prayers that are in the Word of God that there is no missing this doctrine, friend. There, you have to shut both eyes while you're reading the Bible to miss the doctrine of holiness. I mean, you have to be so prejudiced and so biased as to jump over so many scriptures this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 
For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Jesus, in the 17th chapter of John, pray, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Friend, you, you would just have to shut out so much of the scriptures. And sanctification is such a glorious work. We tried to preach the other night about the inward struggle. Oh, it's so good to be free from that inward turmoil. That enmity that wants to pull you away from God. One side of you, the spiritual side of a new birth, wants to go with with the carnal nature that's still lying there, wants to pull the other way. Oh, how I thank God tonight that there's a remedy for all sin. I'm glad that the guilt of sin can be dealt with. I'm glad that the penalty of sin can be removed. And I'm glad that the very nature of sin can be cleansed from our very being and we can be made holy as He is holy. Not in the same infinite measure, but in the same characteristics, God can make us holy. Aren't you glad tonight for that? Surely that must be the pinnacle, huh? Surely that must be the pinnacle of redemption. It's God just wants to get us saved and sanctified. Do you know what a whatnot is? Have I heard that term, whatnot? My mama had a bunch of them. They were just little knickknacks. They weren't expensive knickknacks because mama was poor. Single mother raising three of us kids after dad divorced, they divorced. But she had a few things laying around the house that we called whatnots. They were just things to look at. Some people today can afford a curio cabinet. And they put their whatnots in a nice display case. So when you come in, you can, oh my, those are pretty. Does God save us and sanctify us to put us in a showcase? Do your head this way. (laughs) No, no, no. Does he want you to be saved? Yes. Does he will you to be sanctified? Absolutely. But it's at the end of the road. No, in no way, in no fashion is at the end of the road. Friend, there is growth and there is development and there is Sister Beecher talked about the hammer and chisel in her experience, how God sometimes knock off a few, has he knocked off a few rough edges on you? If not, you're still pretty rough. (laughs) Have you submitted to the chisel? Amen. The potter, the illustration of the potter and the wheel, that's a knife that the potter uses. It's a sharp instrument that he gouges into that clay to cut the excess away. The pruning of the husbandman is a a sharp set of shearing tools. Friends, God has provided these two works of grace to get you ready to do what he wants you to do. Okay, the third thing I'd like to present to you tonight that I ask if it's the end is found in Romans 8, 29. It says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many creatures. Do you believe that God has a desire for each one of His children to resemble Him? Do we give any attention in our daily walk to Lord, help me to be like Jesus today? Do we give a carefulness about being conformed to the image of His Son, who was holy, without sin. I like what Robertson's word pictures. Now I have three Greek sources that I use. Strong's Concordance is a standby. Thayer's Greek is a standby. 
and Robertson's word pictures. Let me tell you what Robertson wrote about this verse. And I don't know if I would pronounce these Greek words correctly or not because to tell you the truth, it's Greek to me. Here we have both morphe, M-O-R-P-H-E with a thing over it, and E-I-K-O-N, and I have no idea, econ, okay? But there's the two Greek words that composes the idea of being transformed into the image of Christ. He said they express the gradual change in us until we acquire the likeness of Christ, the Son of God, so that we ourselves shall ultimately have the family likeness of sons of God. And he got a little blessed. You know what he said? Glorious destiny. <laughs> a Greek you know, scholar. We, got we are changing and we should be changing and we should be transforming our lives. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Friend, we ought to be being transformed, changed daily as we walk and seek to do His will. Lord, help me. I don't want to get so careless in this thing and think I've attained to the level that's all I need is to be saved and sanctified. I tell you, I want to stay in the place where I can morph. <laughs> or is it pronounced morphe? Is we, do we have a Greek scholar here? <laughs> Brother Brewer probably could tell me. Morph, change into the likeness of the family. Amen. Amen. I'm a son. John said, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we see him, we shall be like him. Oh, friend, what a change glorification is going to make. And I don't have time to talk about that one. That's out of our control. If you'll, if you'll do these first three or four things, you don't have to worry about glorification. It'll come automatic. But I want to grow in knowledge and in character into the deeper spiritual life, development through the trials of life and the experiences we encounter. When we grow through the things we suffer and the things that we endure and the things that we experience in life should be continually chiseling and filing and sanding and smoothing down until you, you know, one of these days I'm going to read how they carved Mount Rushmore into four heads. I wonder what size jackhammer they used to cut the face of that mountain. But you know, I don't know what size jackhammer God wants to use on you and me as He tries to shape us and mold us into the image of His Son. You know, the Scripture says, even let this mind be in you. Oh, you're talking about a challenge right there. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Friend, let this mind be in you. He was the meekest man. He was a man of great humility. He was the mighty God, but he washed his disciples' feet. You stop and think about the life of Christ. He was the most unworldly creature that ever lived here. He owned nothing. He owned nothing. He borrowed a, a taxi to get into Jerusalem one day. It had four legs. And went, ee-haw, ee-haw. The robe that he had on that they gambled for was given to him. He told one fellow that wanted to be a disciple, the foxes have dens and the birds have nests. I don't even have a place to lay my head, sir. You still want to follow? Friend, when it, when it comes to adopting and adapting and morph, morphing into the image of Christ... I've got a long way to go. I feel like I fall so short. I think of the compassion that he had for his enemies. Think about it. He didn't look down at his persecutors and say, your day's coming, old boy. 
I'll meet you in a few years at the judgment and it's going to be my say. That wasn't what he did. As they mocked him and ridiculed him and just abased him in every way. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Is Let the mind of Christ be in us. God help us. I think most of us would have to say that I've got a ways to go in some of those areas. I don't like it when people mistreat me, do you? Thank God we don't retaliate. We don't hit them back. <laughs> but do we love them as he loved them? Oh my, this is getting too close. I've got to move on. So we're getting awful close, preacher. I believe there's one more step in this process that God wants us to do. I believe He wants us, friends, not to be whatnots on a shelf, not to just give us a get out of hell free card, not even just to make us clean and pure so we can get together and bask in his glory and shout and praise God and I enjoy that and I want more of that. But friend, I believe he has a work. I believe Christ has a work. What did he tell the Look out onto the fields. They are white already unto harvest. Don't say it's yet four months. The fields are white unto harvest. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest field. There's a song that goes, my house is full, but my fields are empty. Who will go and work for me today? Oh, friends, I believe that every Christian that has a resurrection experience with Christ needs to be volunteering for the harvest. I believe that you can double that when you get sanctified. Now you are equipped to serve Him. Now you are equipped with the power to be His witness. Now you are filled with the Spirit and cleansed from the nature that brings embarrassment to you and to Christ. I tell you, friend, I believe that Christ has a work for us to do. Acts 1.8 But ye shall receive power. <clears throat> After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 4, 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Friend, when they were taken before the council for preaching in the name of Jesus. They didn't come back to the church and say, oh my, they've threatened us severely. We're going to have to bring this to a vote. Are we going to quit preaching in Jesus' name or not? They didn't call a, 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 a meeting a ballot. They didn't call for a vote of the membership to see what they were going to do. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus. Oh, church, we are so far behind the apostolic church of Acts chapter 2 and throughout the early church work. We are so far behind the biblical standard of Christianity. It's really sad. Stop and think how long it's been since you tried to win someone to Jesus. You know, evangelism has pretty much gone by the wayside in our movement as best I can see. We have evangelists. We have revivals and camp meetings, and that's the extent of it in most churches. There are some exceptions, and you may be the exception. And if I'm preaching to the choir here, just pass it on to somebody that's not. But we need to be doing something for Jesus. Well, just dressing old-fashioned is enough. I believe that's a testimony, don't you? You women have an exceptional 
uh, opportunity to witness over and over because you're so very different than the culture has for women in our day. You stand out as, as Christian women. The ladies were out this very week having a lunch together. Some stranger comes up and said, you folks are church folks, aren't you? And you know what? It had such an impression on him. These ladies made such an impression on him, he laid down $30 for the tip for the ladies. Go, girls. Keep putting your hair up. Keep wearing your dresses. Amen. It's giving you an opportunity to speak to the world. Someone said, preach the gospel to every creature and when necessary, use words. But you know, we men sometimes, I mean the long sleeves will sometimes draw attention, but basically that's about all that we have that stands out much. But even us guys get a chance sometimes. I've had people come up to me and I had not how in the world they knew. <laughs> You're a preacher, aren't you? I'm one of those preachers that Brother Keaton used to preach against. You know James Keaton? Early in my ministry, of course, I just did what needed to be done. If the oil change needed to be changed in the car, I changed the oil. If the brakes needed to be worked on, I worked on the brakes. I just, you know, it's survival. <laughs> when you don't have much money, it's survival. You do those things. Brother Keaton gets up in my pulpit and says, some of the preachers, when they go out of the house of the morning, you can't tell whether they're going to get in the car or under it. I said, amen and ouch. <laughs> amen and ouch, preacher. That's right. Some days I've got my bibbed overalls on. Some days I've got my blue jeans and plaid shirt on. And sometimes I've got a tie on. So you never know which way I'm going to go. But you know, whether we've got work clothes on or suit clothes on, we ought to be determined to find somebody today that I can leave a witness to. Because friend, I believe the pinnacle of Christianity is saved and sanctified and dedicated service to God. Now you can disagree, you can take any of the points and you can say, I believe it's the other one. And I believe it's the other one. I, we won't argue one iota. But I believe tonight that the pinnacle is service. Luke 24, 46 through 49, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission, remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Why? So you can preach in His name everywhere. The power of the Holy Ghost is given to us primarily to witness. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, verse 18 through 20. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Matthew 20, 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. Friend, there's not a one among us tonight that cannot minister to someone. The nursing homes today are full of lonely, neglected souls. Anytime you have a free hour or two, you can drop in on a nursing home. Most all of them, unless COVID's got it locked up again. You can go from room to room with your little New Testament. Or maybe if you sing, I was a little troubled that Brother Brewer never asked me to do a special. I think my reputation preceded me. But if you sing, you could go. They, they love to hear Christian songs. They'll let you read the Bible to them. I've had so few rejections in the nursing home, friend. They're lonely. They'll talk to you even about religion, even if they don't want to because they're lonely. And you can talk to them. And you can say, can I pray with you? Friend, the street corners are full of people. Gospel tracts are still available, believe it or not. They're still being printed. 
Oh, I haven't seen a gospel tract in years. Someone, they're being printed. You can access them. You can write your own. You can put your testimony on paper and print it out and hand it out if you're too bashful to tell them. Amen, preacher. I'm going to try to prime them for you, Brother Manley, tomorrow. I'm trying to prime them for the mission service. Someone said we're either a missionary or a mission field. <laughs> but friend, the greatest thing in the world is to be able to give ourselves in service. Clean, dedicated, holy service. We can give it to God. His father, family, decided to send William on a worldwide tour. He paid for him to spend a year traveling around the world. Wouldn't it be nice to have a papa like that? <laughs> but the more William traveled, and the more he saw, and friend, when you get out of affluent America, you see needy people. And the needs of these people in Asia and places began to, to really weigh upon William until he decided, by the time he finished his tour, he decided, I'm going to be a missionary. One friend expressed disbelief that Bill was throwing himself away as a missionary. In response to that friend's comment, William Borden, Bill Borden, wrote two words in the back of his Bible. The first two words he wrote were no reserves. I think I've already preached for 50 minutes, so I've got to cut this story down. I'd like to tell you the whole story while he was at Yale. He went to Yale as a boy about 17 or 18. By the time he was a senior in Yale University, he had started prayer groups on the campus. And of the 1,300 students at Yale when he was there, a 1,000 of them were attending these prayer meetings by the time he was a senior. A soul winner going out into the highways, finding poor people, hungry people, taking and buying them something to eat in the hopes of winning them to Christ. Not a bad idea, huh? You see a homeless fella, a homeless lady? But Bill Borden was a soul winner. He had this tremendous burden for souls. A graduation came, and I'm leaving a lot of the story out. Borden turned down many high-paying positions. But in his Bible, upon his graduation, he wrote two more words. No retreat. No retreat. So William Borden went on to do graduate work at Princeton Seminary in New Jersey. When he finished his studies at Princeton, he sailed for China because he was hoping to work with the Muslims. He stopped first in Egypt to study Arabic. While there, Bill Borden contracted spinal meningitis and with a month, within a month, 25-year-old Bill Borden was dead. He died before he ever got to the mission field. He said, what a shame. What a waste. What a waste. When the news of William quitting Borden's death was cabled back to the U.S., the story was carried by nearly every American newspaper. A wave of sorrow went around the world. Borden not only gave away his wealth, but himself in a way so joyous and natural that it seemed a privilege rather than a sacrifice, wrote Mary Taylor in her introduction to his biography. Was Borden's untimely death a waste? not in God's perspective. Prior to his death, Borden had written two more words in his Bible. Underneath the words, no reserves, and underneath the words, no retreats, you know what he wrote? No regrets. A life lived for Christ. 25 years is not a long life, is it? But I was thinking today about Judy Williams. Do you reckon Sister Judy's regretting dedicating her life to the ministry, giving up marriage, giving up secular employment, giving up whatever, you know, having a, she had a little mobile home. Some of you may not know this, but Judy Williams in her later years had a little mobile home over at Crooksville that she would retire to on those very short breaks 
that they would take between camp meetings. I wonder what kind of mobile home she's living in tonight. <laughs> I say that with real tongue in cheek. You know that. Oh, friends, when I think of, when I think of Nancy Davis and the martyr's crown where a cartel bullet took her life, the sweet singer, Nancy Davis, and songwriter. I believe God in spite of the circumstances she wrote. I don't believe Sister Nancy's bemoaning, giving her life as a missionary, serving God, and they lived in the back of that pickup truck when they first went. I, you've probably heard her tell the Didn't story. Have any privacy much? I mean, real missionaries, real sacrificial people. And they gave and they gave. And they prayed and they prayed. And they worked and they worked. Do you think they're regretting it today? Friend, neither will you. Neither will I if we can labor and work and, and do something for the Master this morning. Think of the, the list could go on and on. Glenn Griffith, the great host of men that have hosted, you know, that have graced this pulpit, that make me feel totally unworthy to be up here. You think in heaven they're sitting around, boy, I wish I'd have took more time off. I wish I'd have went fishing more often. They have plenty of time to fish now. I believe there's some big fish in the river of life, don't you? What are you trying to say, preacher? I think, friends, I think the goal of Christianity is to get you saved, get you sanctified, get you transformed into the image of Christ and get you busy working for Him. He said, I got a full-time job. Paul said, I just, I just make tents to support the gospel. I just work at nights making tents so I can preach during the day. Your secular work is so you can provide for your family and have something to give to those in need. That's scripture, friend. He tells us to work that we might have to give to them that are in need. So you're working to give it away anyway. <laughs> Say, preacher, you're an odd duck. Yes, I am. I admit it. But I've given you the truth tonight. Old Albert Barris would say, I've given you the tree with the bark on it. I've given you the tree with the bark on it tonight. How many want to be at the pinnacle of redemptive purpose? The goal for which Christ redeemed us. I want to be at that pinnacle. And by the help of the Lord, I'm going to keep striving. Amen. Shall we stand? If there's a need in this tabernacle tonight, I want to pray with you. If you're dead, I want to see you come to life. If you're a babe in Christ, I want to see you get grown up, sanctified, holy. If there's some chisel work that needs to be done to transform you, I'll pray that he'll chisel you just where you need to be chiseled. And if you're lax about doing anything for God, I pray the Lord builds a fire under all of us. Anyone tonight want to pray? Friend, it's a good night to get saved. Saturday night was my night. November the 18th in 1978 came on a Saturday night. My Emancipation Proclamation. Roger Hatfield rose from the dead on a Saturday night by the power of God. And you can too. He said, I'll wait for Sunday till we get a more civilized sermon. That's great. If you don't die tonight. Anyone want to pray? Well, I'm excited about these pinnacles, aren't you? I'm excited about all of them. I want to experience every one of them. Amen. So you have four works of grace person? Yes. Yes, ma'am. You want to come up here where we can give you a mic so they can hear you? Or no? I, I don't want to embarrass you. Go ahead, whatever you need. Know.